Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. I'm so glad that you all have joined me. Um, I really do appreciate those who uh, who stick with this. I mean, I know it's not it's it's not easy to get through the entire the entire Bible this way. It's uh, but uh, I think it's very rewarding. Um, I really do enjoy it. Um, so. Um, Thank you for taking this journey with me. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for uh, your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for your constant encouragement. I thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit who is uh, our down payment on the things that you have promised us in the future. Um, I thank you for um, you, your co-labor with us as we endeavor to do your will on the earth, that you haven't just left us alone to fend for ourselves, but yet you are with us and you help us and you guide us, you instruct us, you comfort us, uh, you bear our burdens for us when we cast all our cares upon you, trusting you that you, uh, you you take great care in endeavoring for us when we do that. I thank you, Father. I ask for your help in interpreting this word, and in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, so here we are. Uh, chapter 8 of Second Corinthians. He says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. I think this is interesting because he said they begged several times, and so uh, it's like they. It sounds to me like uh, Paul and the other people with him were like, "You, you, you don't have to do that. You don't really have a lot. You know, there's there's no need for you to do this." But they had heard that the, the believers in Jerusalem were in trouble, and so uh, they knew other churches were giving. And they said, they begged and said, please let us contribute um, because they felt this obligation since the word had come from to them from Jerusalem. And so they felt indebted uh, to, they were like, it's like the least we can do is, is offer a material uh, offering, um, you know, with, out of gratitude for the spiritual blessing that they had received. And so they're so grateful that they want to give. And uh, so they gave, he said he, they gave more than they could afford. And, uh, you know, so uh, I think that's, that's interesting. You know, um, I think that giving is a very personal thing between us and God. I think that we need to, uh, you know, really evaluate it with him. And, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a, it's a sacrifice. So what level of sacrifice uh, is appropriate in any given circumstance, I think, is between you and the Lord, you know, and uh, it's something that can be relational with him. It can be something um, that you do with him, you know, and uh, it can be a relationship builder between you and God, you know, and uh, where you're giving is between you and him, how much you're giving is between you and him, and um, I say make it personal, you know. Um, the Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You know, so endeavor to be cheerful when you do that, but also, um, you know, do that. Uh, be cheerful with him as you give, you know, um, and so pray about it. And uh, I mean, I can say that, you know, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not taking up an offering. So I, <laughs> so it's like I, I feel like I have a lot of range to uh, to discuss it with you and say, yeah, I mean, you know, there are the times when. Uh, it's appropriate to give more than you can afford, apparently. Um, and I know I have, you know, um, I think uh, I don't all the time, but, but, uh, but again, that's between you and God, you know, and where you're giving is between you and God, you know, um, and, and there we are. But the, the pattern set forth here, I do think is a good point, is that uh, they are giving, it's a, it's a one-time offering, but they are giving it toward, toward helping the believers in Jerusalem which which is the origin of the word that they had received that benefited them. So there is something about giving toward um, uh, a, a, a you know an individual or or a ministry or something along that that, that line that has somehow already sowed into you 
spiritually. You know, that's that's a, um, a a key point, I think, although the Bible is not completely clear, although we do see this example here. OK, so anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. So verse six. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm and your love from us. I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year you were the first who wanted to give, and, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. So now, yes, it is a second gift he's talking about. Paul's not going to be directly benefiting from this. He's not based out of Jerusalem. He's, his ministry is based um, in, in Greece and Macedonia, and uh, his means comes from his, uh, his ministry team working and him working. He, doesn't, uh, he, he, he preaches for free. He said it before. So I think that's interesting that Paul is uh, speaking on the behalf of those who um, are not benefiting him. He's just like he's talking to them about giving. It's interesting. So, um, uh, here, okay, I already said that. So, verse 11, so now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. As the scriptures say, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. That's a reference to um, when uh, the manna fell from heaven uh, and the, when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Verse 16, But thank God, he has given Titus the same enthusiasm for you that I have. Titus welcomed our request that he visit you again. In fact, he himself was very eager to go and see you. We are also sending another brother with Titus. All the churches praise him as a preacher of the good news. He was appointed by the churches to accompany us as we take the offering to Jerusalem, a service that glorifies the Lord and shows our eagerness to help. We are traveling together to guard against any criticism for the way we are handling this generous gift. We are careful to be honorable before the Lord, but we also want everyone else to see that we are honorable. So that is an example of living above reproach. You know, everything he's doing is above board. He's like, there's more than one witness. We're not, we're not taking anything. We are, we are transporting the gift, but it's not ours. We are just merely transporting it. So um, he's giving no, there's no, um, there's nothing visible in his ministry that could be uh, brought up to accuse or, uh, or condemn in any way. There, it's it's a it's it's a airtight um, ministry, so to speak, in the, in terms of of how it is honorable both on the inside and on the outside. Put it that way. Verse twenty two. We are also sending with them another of our brothers who has proven himself many times and has shown on many occasions how eager he is. He is now even more enthusiastic because of his great confidence in you. If anyone asks about Titus. Say that he is my partner who works with me to help you. And the brothers with him have been sent by the churches, and they bring honor to God. So show them your love, and prove to all the churches that our boasting about you is justified. I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you are really ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if, somewhat, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, 
and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. So he's talking about that, um, you know, giving builds a relationship. You know, uh, especially if you're giving to someone who actually needs it. You know, it's a... Um, I mean, they tell you that on the field. If you're, if you've ever done any kind of disaster relief ministry or anything like that, it's like you show up. The people are in genuine need. You hand them some water. You hand them something to meet their need. And once you put something in their hand, they're far more willing to listen to you tell them about Jesus because you have done something for them um, naturally. Which I think is ironic because the natural giving that you're you're doing for them is really far less value than sharing Jesus with them. But in their moment of crisis, they don't perceive it that way. And so when you give them something um, without them asking or expecting anything, they're, they're usually like, wow, well, thank you, you know. Um, and then they're willing to, to listen to you because you have, done, you have invested something in them that has now sparked uh, a, some, some uh uh, influence toward a relationship of some type, or um, you could say you've created a connection point, if you will. So now you have you have earned the right um, to be heard on uh, at least the level um, that you have that you have given. So I'm looking ahead here because I want to see uh, what I've got. All right. So, chapter 10. Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I am timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. <laughs> Some people were saying about them to be, about that, uh, saying that about him because he had written that severe letter before, and now they're just reading this other letter. Verse 2. Well, I am begging you now, so that when I come I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. Um... So really, you know, this, this verse applies really to all of us. It's not just to Paul and his, and his traveling companions where uh, the weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal, but mighty in our God for the pulling down of strongholds and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we take every thought captive then to the obedience of Christ. And so it's not just, um, it's not, you know, he's talking about um, confronting people who have wrong teaching and wrong beliefs that are actually pulling other people down and he's saying we're going to bring those those uh, those wayward thoughts captive, or we're going to expose them for what they are, because that's what the weapons that's what uh, the weapons we have do. The weapons of our war, warfare are mighty in God. Now we also use them to do housekeeping in our own mind, because uh, he's like it's uh, taking every thought captive will keep a stronghold from building up in our in our life. And if you can visualize a stronghold being um, like a wall. Uh, that's up against the Lord, you know, that we build, we can build ourselves. People do this all the time. And if you want to think of each individual thought that we think over and over and over again as individual bricks, and we're building up this wall against the knowledge of God. Well, when we take those things captive, that, that wall can't be built up. And so then we're open to the things of God. 
And uh, but when we build strongholds, we actually uh, keep ourselves from entering into all that God wants for us because we are shutting him out of areas of our heart. So anyway, moving on down. Verse 7, look at the obvious facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down. So I will not be ashamed of using my authority. I'm not trying to frighten you by my letters. For some say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person he is weak and his speeches are worthless. See, uh, you can see then on the face of it that people are saying this thing. They're trying to cause division. They're trying to cause a rift between Paul and and other people in the church. And so um, Paul is addressing that. Now, because we, we know from 1 Corinthians that there was divisions in the church at that time. And Paul told them that the divisions among you where you were rallying around certain teachers is actually a sign that you're spiritually immature. And so Paul is sort of, he is dealing with sort of the aftermath of that first letter and then the severe letter that brought about, that we don't have, that brought about um, a response uh, to what he was saying that that uh, actually resolved a lot of the issues in that church. But this is sort of the aftermath. There's still some people there that are trying to cause divisions and trying to get people to turn away from Paul. And it's probably because uh, they have been unseated in a lot of ways. Um, they've probably lost a lot of their influence and they're really upset about that. And so they're trying to regain it back, you know. Um, and so Paul is addressing that. So then uh, verse 11, those people should realize that our actions when we arrive in person will be as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. We will not boast about things done outside our area of authority. We will boast only about what has happened within the boundaries of the work God has given us, which includes our working with you. Why? Because Paul's ministry established that church. So he does have authority um, over uh, that establishment, you see. And so he's like, we, 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 don't, we don't operate outside of our bounds. He's like, I'm not going to go over into some other church that somebody else has established and try to exercise some of the kind of authority and, and boast about uh, what I've done out there. He's like, no. He's like, I, 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 have, uh, I have some right to speak into your life. I, I established the church there. And so he, he, that's what he's saying here. He's like, there's, there's people causing divisions and trying to get you to turn away from me. He's like, but I established this ministry. He's like, and so I'm, I'm coming here to, to exercise the authority that I have by reason of, my, of what I established and the work that God gave me to do there. So he's not wrong. And so um, he says here, verse 14, we are not reaching beyond these boundaries when we claim authority over you, as if we never visited you. For we were the first to travel all the way to Corinth with the good news of Christ. Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow, so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Then we will be able to go and preach the good news in other places far beyond you, where no one else is working. Then there will be no question of our boasting about work done in someone else's territory. As the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. Uh, so how are we on time? That's probably a good place to stop. Because we still have a few chapters. And what we'll do is we'll just finish uh, 2 Corinthians with the next episode. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for uh, your goodness. And your mercy. I thank you that uh, you did use Paul to show us boundary lines of of uh, established works and things of this nature. You know, Paul was an apostle. You sent to uh, Greece and Macedonia, and he established works there. And he so he instructs us about some things about authority and uh, not trying to exercise authority where uh, we have no right to do so. Um, I thank you for these things. And I thank you that you did give us authority to use the name of Jesus, which of course is uh, the greatest uh, tool that we have in our arsenal to be able to occupy until Jesus returns. I thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to ask you for things in the name of Jesus. 
and to believe that whatever things we ask we pray in his name that uh, if we believe when we receive that we'll have those things because we do need things to operate in the earth thank you father that you give us wisdom um, to walk these things out that we have read about and in jesus mighty name i pray amen well bless you guys and we will see you again